in the aftermath of the postponement of the Faith and Arts Institute, originally scheduled for May 2020, we've been developing digital programming featuring artists and scholars whose work may offer us fresh ways of thinking about the connections at this moment between religion, spirituality, and the arts. We began in May with a Black Mountain College Museum and Arts Center Instagram takeover. Our work continues with the Faith in Arts Research Project, a series of conversations with artists and scholars that will continue into the fall. The project will culminate in fall 2021 with the rescheduled Faith and Arts Institute. You can learn more about the project on the Black Mountain College Museum and Arts Center and UNC Asheville websites. Again, welcome. Now, on to the conversation with Krisha Marcano. Krisha Marcano was a member of the Martha Graham Dance Company from 1995 to 1997. And she performed with the Alvin A. Lee American Dance Theater from 1997 to 1999. From 2005 to 2008, she starred in the first principal role as Squeak in the original production of The Color Purple. She has taught dance and performance for numerous institutions and is now professor of musical theater and dance, assistant dean of student affairs and entrepreneurship at UNC School of the Arts. She will be in conversation with Jeff Arnall, executive director of Black Mountain College Museum and Arts Center. Hi, Krisha. Hi, how are you? Nice to see you. I'm doing well. How are you doing? Not bad. I'm, not ha I'm having a good day today. It's beautiful outside. So that's wonderful. That's great to hear. Well, thank you so much for spending time with us today. And I wanted to start at the beginning. I wanted to uh, see if you might share uh, some early memories or uh, early kind of uh, formative experiences with uh, spirituality or faith, um, you know, something that kind of helped you set you on the path that you're on today. Hmm. That's a big one. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, I grew up in the Caribbean. I grew up in Trinidad. I was born in New York, but I grew up in Trinidad in the West Indies and um, Roman Catholic family. And I enjoyed going to church all the time. <laughs> I did. I did. I had a good time. I, all of my former, all of my high school years uh, was in a, nun, a nunnery for high school. So all girls school in a nunnery and I had a blast. Um, and there was a while there that I was, I could see that I wanted to be a nun at some, some point. I just couldn't, I couldn't figure, or rather I didn't think about it, but I was like, I'm going to be a nun. I'm going to be a professional dancer. Not a problem. Yeah. <laughs> the, you know, youth. But both of those things get, made me so happy and got me so close to bliss. Mm. I, is the way I could think about it now as I look back. Those are the two things in my life that were blissful um, every day. It was a, a source of happiness that was so complete. You know, I know those are broad strokes, but in a child's mind, I was, it was just happy it was yeah it was a yes you know sort of yes this is a yes that is a yes that is a no <laughs> there was no sophisticated details in there but um i i remember also being very attached to the holy spirit and the charismatic movement and uh and also saying the rosary constantly i found it meditative <clears throat> and i still say say the rosary now for it's for the way it makes me feel just like if I were to sit and meditate or yoga or anything else that makes me feel feel that way saying the rosary kind of makes me feel feel that way as well but the connection between my spirituality or my religious life and when I discovered dance were so complete and like I said blissful but they were they made me feel the same there was kind of no way that I could not feel connection to the divine when taking dance when taking dance class like it was just this sort of nice connection easy 
uh, direct connection to my spirituality when I was dancing. And I felt the same way in my spiritual life. So it, it kind of came at the same time and it's never really left. Um, so that was quite formative. I think that was, that was the basis, you know? Um, later in my years, obviously, not, not obviously, but as most, a lot of Catholics do, they step away from the religion or step back, as I would say, because I found hypocrisy for the first time. And reconciling that, the first thing you do is step away as opposed to having a conversation, not stepping forward in it, but stepping back. Um, but I found that pursuing my art career, my professional dance career, still gave me that connection to the divine in a way that I didn't feel I was missing anything. And all through my life thus far, saying, saying the rosary still gives me pleasure. So I, I kind of always feel like my art is a divine expression and, uh, and a prayer all, all into itself. So it just is kind of part and parcel. Wow. So. Wow, that, uh, well, that made my day. And uh, thank you for sharing that. And I, you know, I, um, I was raised Catholic as well. And um, my mother uh, um, does the rosary and uh, I, I, I don't, but I, and as an artist, I, I wonder, this is kind of leads perfectly into the next question, that kind of meditative um, experience that you were um, talking about, about uh, with the rosary and your practice of dance and being, um, and even throughout the years and maybe, and, and now, the um, practice and how that connects uh, to um, that kind of meditation, meditative uh, state of being and how it's connected um, to the art, but then also this really um, kind of out of body experience, even though it is really physically in your body. Yeah, a lot of people describe it as being in the zone. Mm. And if you've ever experienced being in the zone, you feel like, okay, a lot of this I'm doing, some of this is not me. Like, let's be very honest. Some of this is not me. And I understand the phrase, the vessel, got it. Threw me up because some of this, right, that's happening right here is not me. <laughs> and that is how, the, what, once you feel that once, it's almost like you run after it, after that. Because it's a feeling that you can't, you can't shake and now you need to feel that more often and feeling like the vessel getting getting myself to a place where i can feel in the zone is a spiritual experience because i mean i don't know who it is who you want to call it i don't know what mm. you want to call it but some of it's not me sure yeah you no know? um and the meditative uh properties of saying the rosary or meditating, it's the repetition, isn't it? It's the repetition of the same words. It's the, it's the rhythm. It's the um, sort of like the music of it. It's the concentrating on your breath, you know, the in, the out, the, simp the simplest things, but just concentrating on the repetition of it mm. and listening, sort of being aware of the, of the space in between the sound. Um, is calming very calm yeah. yeah and and as you go into you know um i'm a musician but i my life is surrounded by dancers my wife is a dancer and i have so much respect and uh, admiration for uh dancers and but the actually the the getting the the movement into your body and actual that practice of movement seems very meditative as well. You're at the bar, you're at the everything, every in and out of the kenosphere, all of this yeah. seems um, so connected. And so if you're not a dancer, Im impossible, <laughs> I have to tell you. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, there's a duality in my mind because trained ballet dancer, but my heart is a, is a modern dancer. So 
in ballet, it kind of always feels like I'm striving to be as ethereal as possible. Like as um, a, 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 not above the earth or above people, but transcending what the human body can do it, it, as though it was more than human. Mm. And in modern dance, it's so grounded that I often surpass what the human body can do. And it's that, it's that training and the in-between juxtaposition of that that you really, in my opinion, and the physicality of it. I mean, this is a, this is a meat suit. Here we are. This is what my meat suit looks like. This is what my meat suit can, can, can do. And stretching, the, the, uh, stretching what that actually is and training the meat suit to actually be available to be in the zone, to have that moment of being the vessel mm. is what, yeah. what? Yeah. Craziness, crazy kukulala, craziness. I also enjoy the high impact, high octane dancing. I like feeling, I know this is gonna sound whoopsie daisy, but <laughs> cause some dad, we're not all well. I mean, you know what I'm saying? I like getting to the brink of like, these are my final moments. Wow. So this is it. I, there's no way that I'm going to be able to take another breath because I am so at my physical capacity. There's no way I have another 30 seconds in me. No way, there's no way. And then to experience what I call the, the gear shift physically and all of a sudden there's new energy new space new yes it's you get to the end of the physical ability and all of a sudden the car gears down like cuckoo and you're like oh what was that and now there's more it blows your mind it blows your mind you can go longer go faster go higher it's it physically kind of blows your mind and i don't know that that's all me i mean the body is amazing. The mind is amazing, but it's, it's a, I, I like it. Absolutely. And there's nothing else uh, to witness it. Uh, you know, I think that other art forms have other things that they could do, but dance and movement really does have that uh, gear shift or there's the, the physicality and spatialization of uh, and working with other bodies um, oh in the space. God. Yes, yeah, it's it's incredible and so fascinating, and it is, um, it's unlike anything else. It's unlike other art forms. Um, I do have to say that I'm also a singer, and there's something about the air and the mm. sound coming out of the body. The physicality of singing uses so much of the body itself, and resonating in the bones of the skull. It's it's fascinating. It's fascinating. Yeah, that's right. And I think uh, um, you in breath, as you as yeah. you mentioned, and um, how our bodies uh, are resonating and continue to vibrate, uh, either through the voice or through uh, uh, you know through song, or even as you talk or as you are um, just being present. Um, it's it's incredible. Just quickly, I would love to hear. A little bit because Graham, Martha Graham Company, which you were you were in, um, there's a lot of deep history in in uh, spirituality and myth um, yeah. in in this history. Theology. That's right. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience and how um, what that was like? I. Well, I, I thought I discovered Martha's work in college when I, got, when I took my first real Graham class and it made me feel like I could sing. I know, I know that sounds crazy, but it felt like it was a perfect fit. It was highly physical, extremely difficult and so dramatic. I am by no means dramatic as you can tell. So <laughs> this was made for me. Um, 
I loved Greek Greek mythology in high school. So this brought all of those things together. Not that that is all, you know, the themes that she, she did, but there's a lot of myth, a lot of spiritual like, um, uh, storyline, storytelling in her work uh, and international, you know, lots of different, different stories of different uh, cultures. So being in Graham made me feel like I had found a fit mm. of all the things that I had enjoyed. Um, it brought me to the brink of death, which I know is dramatic, but I explained it before. Um, I, the first time I, I felt the gear shift, um, the first time I cried on stage because I was overwhelmed by how I was feeling. Um, the drama of it all, it also made me feel powerful. I was a female, I was, I am a female dancer and I was not asked in that company and in the work to always look pretty, but I was asked to always be powerful. So I could be Medea and murder. You know what I mean? I could be um, in Appalachian Spring and ce celebrate the wedding of, uh, you know, and, and this that whole culture, I could be, I could be anything, I could be anything. I could give birth and I could take life. And these are the things that are available to me as a human and not unavailable because I'm supposed to stay in my lane and be a pretty dancer and be a woman. You know, I felt complete in that sort of dramatic death life. Okay, well, obviously I'm in theater, so here we go. But, um, it was nice to be able to pull apart all of those themes in that com company. Yeah. And it kind of really shaped the advocate that I became, the woman I became, the artist I became, because women were strong. Yeah, it, there's such an incredible history and legacy with the Graham Company and I, uh, it's uh, was probably just a, such a profound experience uh, to, to to be a part of it, and um, I love her work. And um, um, you know, you mentioned theater, and I would li like to touch on that too, because um, you've done so much. How does uh, some of these things that we're talking about connect to your work, um, say, in a non dance? setting in a the, uh, theatrical setting? I think the most profound moment was when I was in the original Color Purple. Um, I was one of the principals in that first production of it. And the themes of that book, Alice Walker, what she put together strike deep, strike very deeply. And nobody that came out of that company was unchanged, mm. no one. There is no way that you can listen to that, even subconsciously to that material and those themes and that arc every day for five years mm. and come out the same. Um, I think everybody had a reckoning with whatever baggage meant to them and a reinvestment or re a, a, an enlightening moment and life was different after that. And that, if you, if you talk to anybody that was in that show, ensemble or principal, they'll tell you that you could see people break down. Mm. You could see people gather to pick up and carry, and then you can see people become different. Wow. And that's, that... just, that's just the cast. I can't even talk about me coming out of the stage door, the crowd and people crying and lives changing, uh, women saying, this is my third time seeing the show and I walked away from my abusive husband and I will never mm. live that way again. Like just the themes in the show itself and as much as it was a musical and it was a spec spectacular thing, it went right to people. It went right to people, especially group of people 
you know, the amount of African Americans that never saw theater before until that that uh, show that came in buses. They were they were forever changed. Yeah, it, I think that that's part of why we are doing this faith and arts project is that this this the, what you're describing is uh, these transformative experiences as an artist or as in someone experiencing art and how spiritual practice is connected to art practice and. You, it's, um, you can't put your finger on it always, but th those moments of being in that theater and witnessing uh, that show and having your life changed by uh, your performance and your, the cast's performance and, and this uh, brilliant work is something that's uh, what makes everything tick yes. and makes uh, the universe uh, so much better. Yes. It's yeah. a necessary thing in our society from the minute we're born to the minute we die. Whether you, whether people engage in corporate art mm -hmm. or community art or self art or whatever it is, engage. It, it, it should be a fabric of our lives. You know, we, we, we start learning math at whatever age and then we, we don't have to do it anymore. You don't have to study it anymore, but art needs to continue for the rest of our lives, no matter where you consume it, no matter what you consume, because it is transformative, just like your personal spirituality. And it can be a gateway into finding your personal spirituality, because what it, what it does is figure, you, you can figure out your voice, you can figure out your passion, you can figure out your opinion. You can figure out what you like, what you don't like. You can figure out who you are just by engaging in art. I love that. I, you know, I, this leads perfectly to um, my next question, which is your work as a teacher and as a mentor. Huh. Um, because it's, it's, it's so important and so connected um, and you uh, work at the School of the Arts, but you also have uh, your artistry center. I don't know if you wanted to talk about any of, of this work or you could share some of this with us. Um, so the artistry center is my company and it is about artistry, entrepren artist artistry entrepreneurship and wellness and where they collide. The thing that was missing in my career was I had no mentorship or coaching on how to live as an as a as, an, as a working artist. And the amount of mistakes I made and then had to learn it all over again. And I'm, I'm a constant student, so I didn't mind learning all over again, which is why I went and I got my MBA in entrepreneurship because I needed, I wanted to know. But not everybody has to go get a degree. You can't have an, you don't need an accounting degree to run your, your, your money. Like, you know what I mean? But because we spend so much time in such concentrated practice in order to be the best professional because of competition, um, there is there, there was no space for, so let's talk about your taxes. Hmm. So what about savings? So how do you juggle being a hybrid? So what about streams of income? So what about your transferable skills? So what about when it's time to pivot? How do you, you know, all of the, there's so many things that I could cover. And so that's what the Artistry Center does. So I, I'm a coach private coach, uh, group coach, um, classes and workshops online. And that passion for that made me think, how can I give, how, where is my, my sphere of excellence and the thing I'm most passionate about now, where can I make the biggest uh, impact? Well, exactly where it was never there in a BFA program. It was not there for me, so let's start, start there. So. I went into academia. Um, yes, I teach dance, I teach musical theater dance, but I'm also the assistant dean for student affairs, wellness, and um, mental health, my goodness, and entrepreneurial studies. So I'm invested in having those conversations about the industry, navigating the industry, as well as navigating the life around the thing you went to college to do. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because um, 
I went to um, a Peabody Conservatory. And uh, so the conservatory training doesn't set you up for any of these skills. And a lot of, often um, you don't know why you're there. Yeah. You just know that you do something, whatever it is, and it's you're, you're good at it. And people enjoy it and you're kind of on this path. But all of the other ins and outs of making a living um, and uh, how to keep that kind of honest, you know, in some ways and being like uh, uh, understanding that the world, it doesn't exist as um, a bubble as it does in say a conservatory or a university setting. Um, those are things that no one talked about. So I'm so happy to hear that uh, this is a big part of your work now uh, because it's completely needed. And I think that um, so many, and they kind of give that speech and you probably have witnessed this too. Look up to your right and look to your left. And these people won't be in the arts when you graduate or whatever that's, you know, this yeah. whole thing. And well, it's real. You didn't teach anyone sustainability. You didn't teach anyone solvency. You didn't teach anyone, you know what I mean? You didn't, we didn't teach anyone about thriving because people have to leave because they don't know any better. It's either this or this, as opposed to how come this can't be available to thrive? Why can't we find artistry? Why can't we find financial stability and wellness at the same time? I love that. Yeah. Just a question. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and so in our last uh, couple minutes together, uh, this has been such a difficult time for so many of us uh, this year. And I've been thinking a lot about hope and, you know, and how uh, we could work together on uh, projects so we could be, uh, we could listen to each other, uh, you know, be better listeners. I think that's my life ambition is to be a better listener. And uh, so what can you offer maybe uh, of some thoughts on hope or, or for the future uh, um, as, as we're closing out today? I feel so beat up by the last year. Yeah. And politically as well, I feel I feel feel singed. Um, hope. Well, the we haven't we're not extinct yet, so we keep coming back. So let's keep doing that. Let's keep reinvesting. But you cannot reinvest until you stop and you breathe. Hmm. Yeah, I think we all have to take 2020 as a a clue. Universe made us stop. Sit down. Hmm. Shut up. Stop always surrounding yourself with everyone and listen to your inner voice for a second. And 2020 vision is not a mistake. We should come out of this with more clarity than we went in. If we did, if we did a little bit of work. And right there is where the hope is. What is working? You know what? What is not working? Be real honest. Be real honest. You know what I want? You know what I mean? My kids are not working out. How do I solve that? Because our lives are, this is it. This is it. This is it. So how do you get what you want? Be happy be of service and see happiness in other people's eyes, which makes you happy. Um, and feel like you did this, you know, at the end, it should feel like I did that. I can go, let's do this. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it, but going back and assessing, just like a business, you need a strategic plan, but you need to figure out what is happening right now. You can't plan for the future if you are not telling the truth to yourself. And the minute you tell the truth, it can be very clear. And there might be hope in that right there. Mm -hmm. And the way to feel better about that is to take that, make it done, put it down. <sighs> Whatever you need to do that makes you feel that way. And then go back, you'll see it completely different. You'll see hope in that plan. 
start reconnecting again, but reconnecting intentionally with purpose, not just, I don't want these people in my life anymore. Like, you know, these people, I don't have time. We don't have time. We can make more money, but we can't make more time. We don't have God. So don't waste it. There should be an urgency right now. So get with it, get to it, let's go. That's my advice, come on. Krisha, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it's been a highlight of my week and <laughs> I hope that uh, everyone will feel the same way. I'm sure they will. So thank you so much. Thank you, Jeff, thank you so much.